This video is supported by Brilliant.org. A few weeks ago, I, uh, I did a bad thing. So the Amazon was on fire. Uh, it was all over the news. You guys remember that. And on the Our Ludicrous Future podcast, I repeated the fact that many other YouTubers had quoted out there, which is that the Amazon rainforest produces 20% of the world's oxygen supply. And now I'm joining that same slew of YouTubers by correcting myself. I whipped myself in penance earlier. That whole 20% thing is its just one of those little facts that spread around, uh, not because people are trying to be misleading, but just because it's a sort of a shorthand. You know, I mean, the, the Amazon is super important. That's clear. We all know that. So to say that it creates 20% of the world's oxygen supply, you know, I mean, it just sort of illustrates that point. It might not be true, but it feels true. Truthiness, as they say. And the climate issue is loaded with truthiness statements like that because, you know, it's a big, huge, complex topic and you kind of just need a shorthand or else you'll just lose your mind. And a lot of the shorthand around climate change has centered on CO2, carbon dioxide. It's become the big bad that everybody's focusing on, that everybody's talking about. But it's not as simple as that. And it doesn't work exactly the way everybody thinks it does. The real culprit when it comes to climate change is something completely different. Something you might not expect. Greenhouse gases have been a part of the Earth's climate since the very beginning, and that's a good thing, too. Without some kind of layer keeping some of this heat trapped in here, it would all just radiate back out into space, making the Earth too cold for liquid water to form. And this is exactly the case on Mars. Water just sublimates from ice into gas. It just kind of... What's surprising about greenhouse gas, really, is how little of it there actually is. The composition of Earth's atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, 20.9% oxygen, and around 0.93% argon. Everything else in our atmosphere, including all the greenhouse gases, makes up 0.04%. How could such a small part of our atmosphere make such a big difference? How do greenhouse gases work? So you already know the broad strokes, greenhouse gases keep heat trapped in the atmosphere, but when we're talking about heat in this context anyway, what we're really talking about is infrared radiation. Visible light from the sun travels through the atmosphere almost completely unpeated. It scatters a little bit in the various edges of the spectrum, but for the most part, it travels straight down to the ground and warms up the ground. And when I say ground, I mean surface, obviously. Most of the Earth is water. And the amount of warming on the surface has to do with a few things. First of all, how direct the sunlight is, because the less atmosphere that it travels through, the less it can scatter. And the other is the color of the surface on the ground. If it's a darker color, it's going to absorb more heat. If it's lighter, it's going to reflect most of it back up. This is known as the albedo. And as the surface gets warmer, it radiates that heat out in the form of infrared radiation. This is what actually interacts with the greenhouse gases. Without greenhouse gases, this would just radiate out into space, hence Mars. But greenhouse gases trap that energy in our atmosphere, and they do this a couple of different ways, both of which have to do with their molecular bonds. And to get a better idea of what makes greenhouse gases different, it helps to kind of look at their molecular structure as compared to non-greenhouse gases. The non-greenhouse gases on the left, as you can see, they all consist of only one or two atoms from the same element. This gives them a strong covalent bond and no charge. They are electrically neutral. And far more important for our purposes here, it makes them invisible to infrared radiation. Whereas the greenhouse gases have multiple bonds of atoms of different elements, giving them a slight electric charge and the ability to bend and flex. So when a photon and certain wavelengths of infrared pass close to the molecule, it gets absorbed by its electrical field. This extra energy resonates through the bonds, causing them to stretch and oscillate and bend. Eventually, this photon escapes back out into the world as infrared radiation, which travels in all directions, out towards space, back toward the ground, or across the atmosphere where it can interact with other greenhouse gas molecules. And this is actually illustrated really well in this experiment right here, where they light a candle and then put an infrared camera on it going through a clear acrylic cylinder. And in the infrared spectrum, you can see that flame very distinctly outlined in the infrared camera. And then when they fill that tunnel with CO2, it starts to scatter that infrared radiation around to the point that you can't see it at all anymore. That's because the CO2 is absorbing and then scattering the infrared radiation coming off of that candle. So not only are these molecules bouncing infrared radiation around the atmosphere, they're also bending and flexing and vibrating while doing so. This puts extra energy into the atmosphere. How much energy it puts into the atmosphere depends a lot on its structure and its charge. So carbon dioxide with two bonds traps a certain amount of energy, methane with four bonds traps far more, and sulfur hexafluoride with six bonds traps 24,000 times more energy than carbon dioxide. 
So when people ask what's the worst greenhouse gas, it's kind of hard to get worse than sulfur hexafluoride. On top of the fact that it traps insane amounts of heat, it's also completely man-made, meaning every molecule of it that's up in our atmosphere is there because we put it there. And because it's an inert gas, it doesn't react with anything, which means it stays in our atmosphere basically forever, like 800 to 3200 years. But it can make you talk like this. Oh my, oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! So, I mean, you know, there's that. It's also apparently the air in Nike Air shoes for some reason. The good news is that we don't really make very much of this stuff, even though the numbers of it in our atmosphere are going up. It's still being measured in the parts per trillion. In fact, its contribution to atmospheric warming is considered to be 0.2%. So a gas's contribution to warming in the atmosphere is partly about how much heat it can retain, but it's also about how much is in the atmosphere. So in taking that into account, the amount each contributes to trapping heat in the atmosphere looks like this. You might notice one is missing, a big one. It has the right combination of energy absorption and quantity to make it by far the top most powerful greenhouse gas. Its name? Water. H2O. You might notice a resemblance to the other greenhouse gases with its 143 degree double bond and electric charge. It's a perfect little catcher's mitt for any wandering photons in a particular infrared range. So the more water vapor in the air, the warmer the air becomes. That's humidity. I mean, you've all heard the term, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Well, yeah, exactly. So, ban water, I guess? Obviously, with the world being 80% water, that's not an option. And besides, you don't have to ban water because there's already sort of a release valve for water in the atmosphere. It's called rain. You've seen it in movies, usually falling on John Cusack's head. Water vapor eventually reaches a saturation point, at which point it condenses down into clouds. Those clouds fall to the ground as rain. The rain then evaporates back up into the clouds, and all that cycle continues again. That's called the water cycle. This release valve in the system has been keeping our climate relatively stable for the past several thousand years. But if you look back over deep time, it hasn't always been stable. Everything from asteroid impacts to volcanic eruptions to just the wobble on our axis have messed with this release valve by changing the amount of water vapor our atmosphere can hold. Cold air condenses and hot air expands. We see this day in and day out all throughout our lives. That's why the mirror fogs up in the bathroom when you run hot water because that hot steam meets the cold mirror surface. That's why you get dew on the ground in the morning when the temperature drops in the middle of the night. That's why hot air balloons rise because the heat inside the balloon expands the air inside of it, making it less dense. That way it rises up through the atmosphere just like a bubble in water. Hot and cold equates to higher and lower energy states. So the higher amount of energy there is in an atmosphere, the more water vapor it can hold. Water vapor, which traps more heat, which creates room for more water vapor, which makes more heat, which evaporates the water on the ground and puts more water vapor up into the air. Climate science is littered with feedback loops like this. So something has to raise the energy level of the atmosphere just a little bit, just enough to where it can make more room for that water vapor to get up there and start that process. And this is where those other greenhouse gases come in. Sulfur hexafluoride, ozone, methane, CO2, once we release that stuff into the atmosphere, they absorb that infrared radiation, trap that heat, and make room for more water vapor. The more of this we put up there, the more energy they add. Volcanoes added copious amounts of greenhouse gases, specifically CO2 and methane, and that changed the climate back in the day. Today, we're the ones adding copious amounts of greenhouse gases all day, every day, all around the world. Our society is basically a small volcano that just never stops erupting. And by the way, the way the air expands when it gets hot, same thing happens in the oceans. You know, you hear a lot of stories about the oceans rising, you hear a lot of stories about glaciers melting, and in our heads, I think most of us just put those two things together. Oceans are rising because glaciers are melting. That makes sense. I mean, that feels right. It feels truthy. Yeah, that's not what's happening. Sure, that sounds right, but proportionally, that would be like dropping an ice cube in a swimming pool and then expecting the swimming pool to overflow. There is a lot of ocean out there in the world, and yes, it's a bad thing that the glaciers are melting, but that's not what's causing it to rise. Quite simply, the warmer the oceans get, the more they expand, just like the air. The ocean expands, sea level rises. As Simon Clark points out uh, in this video, sea levels have been rising at an accelerating rate since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In the increase of expansion per degree of temperature, it's not a linear thing. It goes up every single degree. So the warmer the water gets, the more it's gonna expand over time. Liquid water is fickle. 
The conditions required for it to exist, the range of temperatures and pressures are incredibly narrow, actually, when you look at it in the big picture. Most planets don't have it. In fact, so far, this is the only planet we know of that has liquid water on its surface. Water is powerful. It shapes our land and defines the borders on which we can live. Atmospheres that can carry more water vapor create stronger storms, and this is something that we see every year, this time of year, in hurricane season. Messing with that water vapor release valve, it's just a bad idea. And that's why you hear so much talk about CO2 out there these days. It's not so much that the CO2 itself is warming the atmosphere, I mean it is to a small extent, but it's really, it's really more of a Trojan horse opening the gates to one of the most powerful forces in the history of our species. Let's keep that gate closed, shall we? When it comes down to it, all of this, the expansion, contraction of water, evaporation, the water cycle, all that stuff, it's really just physics. And if you really want to get a better idea of the kind of physics that guide our everyday lives, you might want to check out Physics of the Everyday on Brilliant.org. This might be one of my favorite courses on Brilliant because it takes things that are around you, things that you see every day, and it breaks them down and explains how they work. Kind of, kind of gives you a new appreciation for the things that you usually take for granted. From your refrigerator to your toilet to learning how a bike stays upright, you'll get a better understanding of this through this course, and it also covers exactly what's in this video, the greenhouse effect and the water cycle. And this is just one of dozens of courses on Brilliant that go from fundamental science and math to advanced calculus and astronomy, explained with fun animations and puzzles so you can figure it out in a way that makes the most sense to you. Now you can even download courses on your phone and take them with you. Plus there's a daily challenges feature that lets you do a little brain workout every single day to stay sharp. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and get access to their free weekly brain teasers and puzzles and stuff like that. And the first 200 people that sign up for the premium subscription gives you access to all their courses, can get 20% off your subscription for life. Brilliant's a good time and it'll make you smarter too. So brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, links down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that are forming a great community, helping me build a team and just being generally Awesome. Um, we got some new people to shout out real quick. Let me murder their names. We got Joe Kuntz, Henrik Ronholm, uh, Alex Ruffini, Trevor Christmas, Lou Benarts, Vince Dooley, Alan Appel, Nick Klewick, <laughs> Germaine Francoeur, uh, Justin Baker, Matthew Collins, EJ Starkey, Dan Reed, and Greg Taylor. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, and just join a really cool community, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Um, this is a new one. I thought it was kind of fun. A little environmental thing. Thought I'd put it on today. Uh, lots of cool, fun, nerdy shirts you can go check out there. People seem to like them. Uh, yeah, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. You like a good shirt, you'll get a good shirt, you'll support the channel. It's all good stuff. I don't know what to do with my hands. All right, please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this one, so you might want to check that one out. Or check out any of my other videos down there. And if you like them, only if you like them, I invite you to subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.